Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank, every, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the topic today for my CE is total eclipse of the heart, an overview of high alert medications in an acute care settings. This is a patient safety CE for both pharmacists and technicians. Um, so for first, um, my disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Any brand names um, that I may use are for identification purposes only. Um, so we'll just get right into our objectives. So for our pharmacist objectives, we will, be, we will describe the definition of a high alert medication. We will review strategies to reduce the, the risks of errors and minimize harm when using high alert medications, discuss complications related to high alert medication errors, and assess monitoring pa parameters to review when validating orders for high alert medications. For our technician objectives, we will also describe the definition of high alert medications, review strategies to reduce the risk of errors and minimize harm when using high alert medications, and recognize the importance of proper labeling to minimize mistakes. And lastly, identify storage and preparation requirements to help prevent high alert medication errors. So uh, for starters, I just wanted to give some medication errors statistics. Um, Sorry, so um, medication errors results in two to 5% of all hospital admissions worldwide, the majority of which experts believe are preventable. As many as 30% of patients who are hospitalized encounter some degree of medication related harm. 7% of these incidents are considered severe and at least 7 million patients fall victim to preventable medication errors. And more than 25% of these errors incidents are entirely preventable. So not only is the problem associated with an increased length of stay in the inpatient setting, but it also increases morbidity, mortality, and additional costs to the healthcare system, costing the U.S. healthcare system estimated about $21 billion annually related just to medication errors alone. So this presents pharmacists and pharmacy technicians with the prime opportunity to prevent these mistakes and ameliorate the problem. So what contributes to um, errors? So there are many factors that increase the risk of medication-related harm. Um, the first three here I've listed are more related to the patient themselves. So advanced age, renal impairment, and presence of chronic disease or comorbidities, um, but also the complexity of the patient's medication regimen. So each medication added to a regimen increases the risk of medication-related harm exponentially. And of course, the administration of high-risk medication, which is the topic for today. So ISMP, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, this is an organization dedicated to patient safety. Um, they themselves define high alert medications as drugs that bear a heightened risk of causing significant patient harm when they're used in error. Um, mistakes may or may not be more common with these drugs, um, but the consequences are more devastating to the patients um, themselves. So ISMP has some strategies to prevent errors, um, and these safeguards include standardizing ordering, storage, preparation, and administration of these medications, improving access to information about these drugs, limiting access to high alert medications, um, using auxiliary labels, employing clinical decision support and automated alerts, and using redundancies such as automated or independent double checks when necessary. So these are some of their safeguards, but they also have targeted medication safety best practices. They have some general ones and then more specific ones related to specific medications that I'll dive into when I'm discussing those. But some of the broader ones include seek out and use information about medication safety risk and errors that have occurred in other organizations outside of your own facility, and then take action to prevent similar errors. So kind of learn from other people's mistakes to see how you would handle it and how you could prevent a similar error from occurring in your own facility. Um, limit the variety of medications that can be removed from an automated dispensing cabinet or an ADC uh, while using the override function. And then also when compounding sterile preparations, perform an independent verification to ensure that the proper ingredients, both the medication and the diluent are added, um, including confirmation that the proper amount of each ingredient is added um, prior to putting it in the final container. Um, like I've listed on this slide, these independent double checks um, are important when we're dispensing medications, but the second check is also used um, per ISMP. It should be used on the nursing side, both um, in three circumstances, including prior to administration of the medication, whenever a IV bag is replaced or whenever the rate of the infusion is changed, there should be a second check involved. And also administration via an infusion control device is highly recommended by ISMP. So I've included here a little 
picture of one of the posters we have hanging in the pharmacy. I know there's one in the Ivy room and there's another one um, circulating somewhere in the pharmacy. And this includes a lot of the auxiliary labels that we put on our own IV medications that are prepared in the IV room. And also just the medications that we dispense right from the VCs. So I'm sure we rec rec recognize a lot of these. Um, the pink high alert medication um, sticker is included on uh, the digoxin injections. All the ampules get a little flag sticker. Um, our insulin infusion gets this yellow sticker. Any hypertonic saline that we make from the IV room gets this orange sticker. And then our potassium infusions get this red sticker. Chemotherapy agents um, get these one or both of these in, uh, stickers as well. Um, and then we also have some of these more stickers. As you can see, they're bright and they're big, bold letters as a, a uh, safeguard for us and also for nursing when they receive our products to give a little extra care for these um, drugs because of the risks that go along with them. So here is a list of ISMP's high alert medications. Um, it is a pretty extensive list, but um, for reference, Stony Brook itself has a list of a very similar list on the Pulse, part of the policies and procedures um, that lists these medications, but then on the Stony Brook one, we also have a little bulleted list of some of the safeguards that we have in place, just a generalized statement of what we're doing here to try to handle these high alert medications and prevent errors. Um, I'm going to be diving into a few of these um, throughout this presentation today. So my main for focus today is ACLIPS. So ACLIPS is the Stony Brook designated high alert IV medications. Um, this list is reviewed, maintained, and approved by the Medication Safety Committee based on the guidance of ISMP, the Joint Commission Standard, and the best known practices. So ACLIPS st um, stands for anticoagulants, specifically the IV anticoagulants, calcium, both um, the chloride and gluconate, digoxin is the L, the brand name lenoxin, then insulin, um, the insulin IV, except in parental nutrition admixtures, then potassium, both chloride and phosphate, and then sodium chloride. And this is specifically um, hypertonic saline, um, which is defined as any um, concentration more than 0.9%. So first we're gonna dive into the anticoagulants. Like I said, it is the IV anticoagulants. So these infusions uh, include heparin, argatroban, and bilberudin. So heparin is actually not considered a high-risk medication when it's dosed as an additive for lide patency. Um, so some of the reasons you might see an insulin infusion ordered for venous thromboembolism treatment, also deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism treatment, also for AFib, uh, percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI, and also for bridging warfarin therapy. Our gastroban and bilverudin are um, reserved for patients with hyper, uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, um, and this is used any, uh, in any situation where we would have liked to use heparin, but because of their allergy, we can't. And then bilverudin, you'll see more in cardiac surgeries. So the biggest risk with anticoagulants, both IV and just oral anticoagulants, is we want to make sure they're properly anticoagulated, because if they're not properly anticoagulated, they can clot. But if they're over anticoagulated, that's when we have the bleeding risk. So both the bleeding and thrombotic events that occur related to therapy are investigated by the Medication Safety Committee here at Stony Brook. Um, so some of the safeguards that I have here and throughout my presentation today, I'm gonna to go over kind of what we do here and also what ISMP may recommend as well. So in terms of storage, ISMP recommends um, red bins with high alert auxiliary labels, um, both when it's stored in the pharmacy and then if it's in the um, automated dispensing cabinets as well, or at least having a high alert sticker on the bin itself as just another flag for whoever's um, pulling the medication or um, that this is a high alert medication um, in terms of ordering. So all of these IV anticoagulants have a power plan that can be used when ordering them. Stony Brook uses approved protocols for the initiation and maintenance of the anticoagulation therapy appropriate for the medication used, um, the patient population being treated, uh, the condition being treated and the potential for drug interactions. Um, and this also actually helps um, make sure it's ordered properly in terms of units. So especially heparin is ordered in units and we wanna make sure units is written out and it's not the U that used to be an issue when we more had we had written orders, um, but these power plants and these automated or um, this electronic ordering kind of did away with that error. Um, in terms of preparation, so we do have limited concentrations. A lot of these are pre-made concentrations that we um, order and we already have that helps to make sure when we're administering them, it's just a constant concentration that the nurses have to deal with. Um, and they are administered via an infusion control device. 
and also monitoring. So the power plants themselves have built in monitoring parameters and nomograms that when the provider puts in the order, these lab values and monitoring are already included. So the nurse knows how often to check a level, what levels to be checking and what to do with each level, whether you have to titrate the bag itself or you have to notify the provider of something that's already built in the power plan to kind of help take some of that work out of it and make sure everything is standardized. Um, ISMP also has targeted, one of the targeted medication safety best practices is to ensure all appropriate antidotes, reversal agents, and rescue agents are readily available, which we do have available for um, these IV anticoagulants. So this is a list of the lab monitoring and anti of anticoagulation medications. Um, you can see there's both baseline and ongoing monitoring lab tests that are needed. This list is pretty extensive and includes um, the IV uh, medications, but also some of the oral ones and the subcutaneous ones. Um, this is more for reference because as you can see, there's still a lot that goes into it, but this is included in the power plan. So the, the provider won't ever forget to order something that's already included once if they're using the power plan. Um, so this is awesome that we do this here. Next up, we have electrolytes and fluids. So we're going to start with potassium, the P and A clips. So a normal level is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Potassium is the major intracellular cation and plays a critical role in cell metabolism, including both protein and glycogen synthesis. Um, the sodium potassium ATPase pump and plasma protein concentration are the most important in the day-to-day -day regulation of potassium balance. Um, so the reason we would be giving potassium back is because they are hypokalemic. So um, some of the causes of hypokalemia include depletion in, um, induced by abnormal potassium losses via the urine or stool, um, a transcellular shift of potassium from the extracellular fluid into cells, and this can be due to metabolic alkalosis or increases in insulin or catecholamines. They can also be hypokalemic from an inadequate dietary intake or some, from medications, specifically diuretics, insulin, like I mentioned, laxatives, beta-2 agonists, and some antimicrobials, specifically penicillins and aminoglycosides. So hypokalemia, uh, patients are typically asymptomatic when it's mild, which is considered when their level is three to 3.5. But once it drops below three, they can start to present with some nonspecific symptoms, such as generalized weakness or lethargy, but more severe consequences include muscle necrosis, ascending paralysis, arrhythmias, and possibly death. So we definitely wanna make sure we're repleting their potassium and getting them in this normalized range. But by giving potassium, um, we can either give it orally or IV. And if we're going to be giving it IV, that's when we have some of these high alert risks, including extravasation, arrhythmias, such as specifically bradycardia and ventricular fibrillation, and death. So when we're giving, when I'm talking about IV potassium, um, not it does not apply to parental nutrition, dialysis fluids, or large volume parental solutions of 60 milliequivalents of potassium per liter or less. Um, so some of the things we do here to kind of standardize it and, and give special care for these high alert for this high alert potassium is the concentration concentrated potassium chloride, phosphate, and acetate are not stocked on any nursing unit as floor stock. So any order for these infusions are printed in the IV room and we make it patient specific. And they do get that red um, potassium infusions um, auxiliary label added to the bag, and then we send it up then. It also in terms of administration, so parental potassium replacement um, should never be given IV push, and an infusion control device should be used when administering it, uh, IV potassium. So I've kind of wanted to review the potassium policy that we've created here at Stony Brook. Um, that's kind of in place to monitor how much potassium you're getting because we don't want to give them too much potassium and risk those arrhythmias and the possible death if it's given too fast. So in terms of maintenance replacement, um, the max concentration that can be given to patients without a cardiac monitor is 60 milliequivalents per liter at a rate not exceeding 10 milliequivalents per hour. So all other concentrations greater than this or given faster than this, these patients should be requiring a cardiac monitoring. And this is specifically for potassium chloride and potassium acetate. And then for rapid replacement, so this depends where, it kind of depends where they are in the hospital and that's gonna dictate the concentration that they can receive um, and how they can receive it. So on a, adult acute care units, the solution can contain 10 milliequivalents and 100 mLs over at least one hour. At this concentration, when available, central access is preferred, but it's not required for the administration of this dose. And no more than 40 milliequivalents are given before monitoring of a potassium level um, is 
required. And this is accepted in extraordinary circumstances, such as if the potassium level is less than three milliequivalents per liter. In the ICU, um, the max they can get is 20 milliequivalents per KC, of KCL in 100 mLs over one hour, but this requires central venous access or a dual lumen midline catheter. Um, on the ICU, they can receive no more than 60 milliequivalents IV before a serum, serum potassium level is obtained. And like I mentioned, venous, central venous access is required for administration of this dose. And lastly, in the CTICU, these patients can receive 30 milliequivalents of KCL in 100 mLs given over one hour. This dose may be repeated once more if the potassium is less than 3.6. And central venous access is 100% required for administration of this dose. This is super concentrated. Um, next is potassium phosphate. So potassium phosphate is ordered in millimoles. So three millimoles of potassium phosphate is equivalent to about 4.4 milliequivalents of potassium. So that is kept in mind when determining the max that these patients can receive. So in terms of the maintenance replacement, uh, patients can receive 10 millimoles of potassium phosphate in 250 mLs of solution without requiring cardiac monitoring. Anything more concentrated than this, they do require that um, cardiac monitoring for maintenance replacement. In terms of rapid replacement, again, it depends where they are in the hospital. So on acute care units, they can get 10 millimoles of KFOS in 250 mLs infused over at least three hours. For this, central venous access is preferred but not required for administration of this dose, and they can get no more than two doses or 20 millimoles in total before a serum potassium and phosphate level is obtained. And then in the ICU, no more than 30 millimoles is given. So they can get 15, 20, or 30 millimoles infused over four hours. But here they require that central venous access or dual lumen midline catheter. Um, and again, they need 30 before, they can get 30 before they, um, another level is obtained. So just some special monitoring considerations with potassium. On all units, we can replete, I'm talking mostly for IV potassium, but we can also replete with oral potassium. So no more than a total of 100 milliequivalents of both oral and IV can be given before a follow-up serum potassium is drawn. So if oral potassium is given though, the time of blood drawn is, must be reflective of the time needed for absorption. So we have both liquid and um, extended release tablets. So if they're getting a liquid formulation, absorption occurs over approximately one hour. So we wanna make sure that level that they're getting is more than an hour after their oral dose, their oral liquid dose of potassium. For the time release tablets, absorption occurs over approximately four hours. So we wanna make sure they're waiting at least four hours before they're getting another level of potassium because if they get it too soon, that doesn't reflect the full absorption of both the IV and PO potassium that they received. So if we dose it based on that level, that might not be a true, their actual level might be higher than that and it might cause them to become hyperkalemic. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind when verifying these potassium orders and how soon they received the oral potassium. Next up, we have calcium. So that's the C in Aclips. So calcium is essential to um, many physiological functions, including the preservation of integrity of cell membranes, neuromuscular activity, regulation of endocrine secretory activities, blood coagulation, activation of the complement system, and also bone metabolism. Normal level is about 8.6 to 10.3 milligrams per deciliter. Um, so hypocalcemia, the risk of hypocalcemia can cause both cardiovascular and neuromuscular complications. Cardiovascular include hypotension, decreased myocardial contractility, or prolonged QT interval. And for neuromuscular complications, it can include muscle cramps, tetany, and seizures. So we definitely want to replete their calcium to get them in this normalized range. But some of the causes of hypocalcemia include vitamin D inadequacy or resistance, hypoparathyroidism, renal disease or end-stage liver disease, um, hypomagnesemia or hypermagnesemia, sclerotic metastases, infusion of phosphate or citrated blood transfusions, critical illness itself can cause hypocalcemia, and then medications. So some of these medications include radiocontrast, estrogen, loop diuretics, bisphosphonates, some antibiotics and some anti-epileptic drugs as well as sinicalsa can also cause hypocalcemia. So when we're gonna give IV cal um, calcium back, we have two salts that we can choose from, both chloride and gluconate. They're both high risk when administered as IV push or IV rapid replacement. Um, so the risk of too rapid infusion, uh, intravenous injection include hypercalcemia. So um, 
Some of the milder symptoms include fatigue, nausea, vomiting, um, constipation, anorexia, or confusion, but hypercalcemia can also cause cardiac arrhythmia, specifically bradycardia, and then even severe hypercalcemia can lead to acute renal failure, obtundation, ventricular arrhythmias, coma, and death. So we definitely don't want them to become hypercalcemia, calcemic. Um, can also cause a moderate fall in blood pressure due to vasodilation. Extravasation and necrosis can occur. Um, so we definitely want to give either central axis or in a deep vein when we're giving both calcium chloride and gluconate. And then, like I mentioned before, um, too rapid can cause the ventricular arrhythmias or cardiac syncope. Calcium chloride is generally considered the most irritant of the commonly used calcium salts. And since it is an acid acidifying salt, it's usually undesirable in the treatment of hypocalcemia um, of renal disease. And just another thing to keep in mind with calcium infusions, so precipitation is a common thing that we think of when we think of calcium, um, but specifically with ceftriaxone, ceftriaxone is a commonly used broad spectrum antibiotic, um, but there is an interaction and they should not be given at the same time because of the risk of precipitation. So if they do require uh, calcium while they're getting ceftriaxone, it's important um, that they use different infusion lines at different sites, or if they only have one infusion line, either it's replaced or thoroughly flushed um, between the infusions to prevent any precipitation that may occur. So calcium chloride and gluconate in terms of storage, so they're both stored in the pharmacy. Chloride can also be found in crash carts for emergent use. Um, for preparation, we wanna use standard concentrations and high alert auxiliary labels should also be used when administering um, both chloride and gluconate. And then in terms of administration itself, so gluconate should not be given faster than 200 milligrams per minute and chloride should not be given faster than 100 milligrams per minute. Um, and then in terms of monitoring, we wanna monitor their calcium levels to make sure they're in that 8.6 to 10.3 range, but we also wanna monitor their EKGs and vital signs when we're giving these rapid infusions. Lastly, we have the, for fluids, hypertonic saline. So like I mentioned before, this is any concentration greater than 0.9%. Um, so normally this is gonna be when patients are hyponatremic. So that's usually the treatment is hypertonic saline. So the risks of giving hypertonic saline include extravasation, osmotic demyelination syndrome, coma and death. So the osmotic demyelination syndrome is almost exclusively related to how fast the sodium deficit is corrected. So the rate and magnitude are important here. It kind of depends on what type of hyponatremia they have. So if it's acute, um, we, we don't want to raise the sodium faster than four to six milliequivalent per liter within a 24 hour period. If it's more chronic um, or more severe, we don't, the max that we can increase the serum sodium is um, about eight milliequivalents per liter in a 24 hour period because um, we don't want to risk that osmotic demyelination syndrome. Um, in terms of storage, so hypertonic saline is stored in the pharmacy. All concentrated bags are stored in the pharmacy and only dispense at specific patient doses. The only asterisk to that is that there, you can find concentrated sodium chloride um, in the NCCU and ED, and this is for the treatment of elevated intracranial pressure, but this itself is stored in a segregated area in the automated dispensive cabinet. It's not floor stock that the nurse can accidentally grab and mistake for a normal saline bag itself. Um, when we make it um, here in the pharmacy, it gets a special auxiliary label, that orange sticker that I showed earlier in the presentation, and it also goes in a red bag as another flag um, to the nurse and the providers on the floor that this is a high alert medication, so it should get special care when going to the patient. And then administration, so it should be through a central vein, um, unless it's an extraordinary circumstance, such as in the ED where they might not have that central access available quite yet, but we want to make sure a one-time dose is fine, but anything more than that, we definitely want them to get central access. So just a quick little review of um, the information. I know it was a lot of information. Um, where is hypertonic saline stored in Stony Brook University Hospital? I'll give you a second. Yes. Yes, it's stored um, mainly in the pharmacy, but we do have those two areas, the NCCU and the ED, where you can find it in the um, ADC. So next up, I have insulin, the eye in clips. So we know insulin is the primary treatment option for diabetics while they are hospitalized. Patients admitted to the hospital should have all previous oral and non-insulin diabetic therapy discontinued. And we know the biggest risk with insulin is um, hypoglycemia. 
So in terms of storage, ISMP recommends storage of concentrate, high, higher concentrations must be stored separately from other insulins. They also recommend using red bins with high alert auxiliary labels as well for these um, insulin, both the insulin infusions and the like vials of insulin themselves as well. Um, in terms of ordering. So we do have power plans that should be used when placing orders. We have a bunch of power plans for the insulin infusions, including a DKA power plan, a non-DKA power plan, and a labor and delivery um, insulin infusion plan. Um, these plans themselves have administration and monitoring instructions defined at the time of order entry in them. So this is more, when we're verifying it, we wanna make sure that's there. And it's more for the nurse when they're verifying it and when they're giving the medication itself. Um, in terms of preparing and dispensing, we send pa patient-specific insulin and we have uh, the available concentrations are limited. So we have our standard infusion bag that's dispensed from pharmacy um, that we also get that, uh, it was like a yellowish sticker that goes on that says it's an insulin infusion as another little flag for the nurses themselves. And in terms of administration, again, the infusion should be given through an in infusion control device. For monitoring, so, I believe it was Joint Commission that said that the A1C within the past 90 days is required for patients getting insulin and also point of care glucose should be included. So these patients on these infu insulin infusions are getting their uh, glucose checked every one to two hours. So that's usually included in the power plan. And also according to the ISMP targeted medication safety best practices, um, it says to ensure all appropriate antidotes, reversal agents, and rescue agents are readily available. So most of these, um, the infusion power plans, but also the sliding scale insulin power plans have included in them an order for glucagon, glucose gel, and dextrose. And this is kind of going along with the ISMP targeted uh, safe best practice um, to make sure if these patients do become hypoglycemic, they have these orders on already to handle that situation should it occur. Some special considerations that I wanted to touch upon with insulin. So the biggest thing when patients are put on these insulin infusions is eventually to titrate them off of it and onto subcutaneous insulin. So continuing continuous insulin infusions should be transitioned when the patient begins to eat and the blood glucose levels are stable. Um, and then this subcutaneous insulin should be administered at least one to two hours prior to dis discontinuation of the infusion. So we don't want to shut it off and then give the insulin. We want to give the subcutaneous first and then titrate the insulin, the infusion off. Another uh, special consideration is the co-administration with parenteral and enteral nutrition. So patients receiving concurrent insulin therapy are at a risk for hypoglycemia anytime the therapy is interrupted. So extended interruptions should be reviewed carefully to ensure an appropriate insulin regimen is ordered. And lastly, insulin for the treatment of hyperkalemia. This is when you might see an, an IV push um, of insulin regular, somewhere anywhere between five and 10 units, but you wanna make sure that's also accompanied with a one-time order for dextrose push as well, because we we're definitely concerned with their uh, potassium level, but we don't wanna forget about the fact that this can cause hypoglycemia. So we wanna make sure that is also included when we're verifying these orders. So I have a quick patient case question related to insulin. GH is a 17 year old female who presents to the hospital with a chief complaint of vomiting, fatigue and increased urination. Her blood glucose is found to be 750 milligrams per deciliter and her A1C is 10.2. She's admitted to the ICU for diabetic ketoacidosis and was started on an insulin infusion. When can she be transitioned to sub-Q insulin? I'll give everyone a second. Feel free to type it in the chat. Yes, D is the answer, both B and C. So we want to make sure she's eating and her blood glucose levels are stable. And again, we want to give the subcutaneous um, insulin before we shut off the infusion itself. So lastly, the L in Eclipse is digoxin, the brand name Lenoxin. So why is digoxin a high alert medication? We know it's given for both heart failure and supraventricular arrhythmias. Um, there are a few reasons. So First, the narrow therapeutic index for heart failure, we typically want the level between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9 nanograms per ml. For other indications, we can go 0 0.8 to 2. The toxicity risk increases when serum concentrations are greater than 2 nanograms per ml, but the toxicity itself can occur at any time and may occur at lower levels in the setting of hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, or hypothyroidism. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind when we're putting these patients on IV digoxin. 
It's also the IV formulation is a vesicant, so extravasation risk is there as well. There are many drug interactions with Jackson, um, so this can both make them super therapeutic or under therapeutic. Um, so that's something as well to keep in mind when we're verifying orders. If there's any of these flags that we're notifying uh, providers of this risk, that's there because the toxicity itself can be life threatening. Um, we know when we send a Jackson, when we send it patient specific or when we put it in the Pixis itself, it gets that high alert sticker on all of the, the ampules, that pink flag sticker that goes on it um, as an extra um, flag for the nurses when giving the medication. And then again, along with the ISMP targeted medication safety best practice of ensuring appropriate antidotes, reversal agents, and rescue agents are readily available. Digoxin does have a reversal agent should patients become super therapeutic and start showing signs of toxicity. Um, and that is digoxin immune fab or digifab, which has a calculation that can be done to determine the amount of vials that are needed to reverse the digoxin. So that's all the um, medications included in ACLIPS, but I just wanted to touch on, upon a few other medications um, that are common high alert medications as well that we see daily at the hospital. First up is warfarin. So before I go into warfarin, I just wanted a quick review question. Um, what is the goal INR range for patients on warfarin without mechanical valves? I'll give everyone a second. Yes, B is the answer, um, two to three. We know our regular INR uh, for patients not on warfarin is about one, but we do want them to be a little higher when they are controlled for on warfarin. So warfarin, we know there's a lot of monitoring that goes into it and a lot of dietary um, aspects of it. So we have a warfarin power plan that can be used. Baseline INR is needed in order to initiate the power plan. And then um, there's a dosing algorithm available and dose adjustments required an INR as well. Reversal guidelines are also included in the power plan. Um, and when we're verifying it, we pharmacy reviews the patient's latest, latest INR before dispensing a new warfarin dose. So the related lab, the INR is actually pulled into the field of the verification screen um, to flag you if you like for, were to forget to go into it um, as a little flag that this is the most recent INR and use this when you're deciding if this is the correct dose that they should be receiving. We also only dispense unit dose warfarin tablets. Um, and the order itself is just for that day. It's not really a standing order. They have to reevaluate every day. Um, and another thing that I thought was cool was that the clinical nutrition service is also notified of all patients receiving warfarin in the hospital via a consult generated from Cerner because we know diet can affect how well warfarin works. So while the patients are in-house, their diet is kind of controlled with the nutrition service, but we want to make sure that that's carried over when they are discharged. So we have also this process here. So prior to discharge, Patients and families are given a standardized hospital approved patient education material related to the therapy. And then upon discharge, they receive the written instructions that include issues related to compliance, dietary recommendations, the importance of follow-up monitoring and the, how important it is to check INR and the potential for adverse drug reactions and interactions um, to notify the patients of what to look out for should they become overcoagulated and what to do in that circumstance. Next up, we have neuromuscular blocking agents. So this includes cystatricurium, rocuronium, succinylcholine, and vecuronium. These are paralyzing agents, so it makes sense that they are high alert medications. Um, they are used for rapid sequence intubation in the ED and for paralysis in the OR. These require special attention when verifying these medications because we wanna make sure they are intubated with a protected airway and sedated before we are paralyzing these patients. And the infusions that we may make in the IV room, as well as the vials themselves that we store in the pharmacy, um, require auxiliary labels um, as another flag for the nurse when, when hanging the bags or when using the vials themselves, that it is a paralyzing agent. ISMP has a targeted med safety best practice specific for neuromuscular blocking agents, and they suggest um, to segregate, sequester, and differentiate all neuromuscular blocking agents from other medications wherever they are stored in the organization. So this includes in the pharmacy, but it also includes in patient care areas where they're needed, specifically in the intensive care unit, in the ED, like I mentioned, or the OR. Um, they recommend placing it in a sealed box or in a rapid sequence intubation kit, um, or to keep them in limited availability in automated dispensing cabinets, um, which we do here. I just wanted to touch on um, this unfortunate circumstance that occurred about two years ago when a nurse in Tennessee, um, a, a patient came in for a standard procedure 
And um, it is common practice for some of the anxious patients to get a small dose of benzodiazepines before a procedure. And this nurse went to get midazolam from the Pixis. Um, in the override function, she started typing in um, Versed, the brand name for midazolam. She typed in VE and picked Vecuronium, the first VE that showed up and um, pulled it because she was in the override function. There was no flag or anything that stopped her from pulling it. And there was no double check that happened. There was no scanning and she drew off the medication and unfortunately pushed the medication and the patient expired. So this is a very unfortunate situation that occurred, but it is proof that the safety measures we have in place, including um, the limited override, the scanning functions, the storage functions that we have, we try to prevent something like this to happen. Like this is something that was completely preventable, but it was just a um, almost reckless, they described it as um, a reckless behavior that was a, had a devastating outcome. And then lastly, we have therapeutic agents. So therapeutic agents we know are high alert, high risk medications. Some of the risk mitigation strategies we have here at Stony Brook is that an attending approval and signature are required on the orders, a double check by nursing is required, and that administration is only by certified oncology nurses. We have spe special auxiliary labeling that I kind of showed earlier on one of those um, posters that we have in the pharmacy. Um, all of chemotherapeutic agents should be delivered by hand. They cannot be tubed. And then... Um, Vin, the VIN Christine protocol we have. So the VIN Christine protocol is right in line with one of ISMP's targeted best practices of dispensing VIN Christine and other vinco alkaloids in a mini bag of a compatible solution and not in a syringe. So VIN Christine here is dispensed in a mini bag form. The only exception where you might see it in a syringe is if central port access is lost in pediatric patients. And in this situation, only the physician may administer the medication and the syringe is not released until all other intrathecal medications have been administered. So the biggest thing here is we don't want it to be incorrectly given intrathecally. So all chem chemotherapy medications are prepared and dispensed by pharmacy. Um, orders are processed by the pharmacist. Um, we have the MART pharmacists who are awesome. They recalculate the dose, review applicable lab results, review the protocol for reference um, or reference sheet for non-protocol regimens. They verify the order with the prescriber if the dose varies by plus or minus 10% compared to either the prior dosing for the patient or the standing dosing uh, for the ordered agent per protocol or reference sheet. And then they also verify that there's a presence of two nurse signatures on the order. Um, our pharmacists also prime the tubing connected to the IV and then the labeling. So these chemotherapy agents get a chemotherapy sticker on the product bag, as well as the plastic outer bag that it is stored in. And then then Christine, we have that whole protocol. It also gets a special auxiliary label that says fatal if given intrathecally for IV administration only. So in summary, ISMP um, guidelines defines high alert medications as drugs that bear a heightened risk of causing significant patient harm when they're used on error. The list can be found on the ISMP website. But again, like I mentioned earlier, here at Sony Brook, we have our own list, which is almost identical to the ISMP list. But plus on our side, we have what we do here to kind of deal with these high alert medications and the strategies we have to try to prevent med errors. Um, Aclips was specifically the top IV high alert medications here at Stony Brook. Aclips is just a quick way to remember the, those um, six medications. Um, we have these policies and procedures to prevent meta errors and adverse events with these medications. And of course, precaution is always needed when ordering, verifying, dispensing, administering um, any of these high alert medications. So that is it for me. I'll open it up for any questions that anyone may have. I have a question, Marie Varela. Hi, uh, yeah. Hi, so can you describe the difference between high alert and high um, risk medications as per our policy? Um, I kind of included both, like I kind of use them interchangeably here for high alert and high risk medications. Okay, but can um, you speak to what the difference, what the difference is? I'm not sure exactly how it's defined here. Okay. So the Eclipse meds were the first group of meds that we agreed that we would do special things for. And, and mostly that affects nursing because all of those 
um, medications, first of all, they're all IV. And second of all, you know, even it doesn't count for digoxin tablets. It's only for IV forms of all those drugs. And the, um, the idea was to have um, not only us make sure we're taking a good look at them, but for nursing to always look at some kind of labs, there's, there's some kind of lab that they have to look for for all of them and to have an independent double check that's actually witnessed and signed for upon administration. The rest of the meds is the rest of the list from ISMP that we included in the policy as high alert, which they call them high alert. And those are the drugs that we acknowledge have risk associated with them that we do other things that don't fall into that eclipse category. So we don't you don't necessarily have to look at a lab. You don't necessarily have to have a second signature, but there's something that you need to do to safeguard them, whether it's put it in a power plan or put it in a special bag or you know something that makes it safer because they all have different um, risks associated with them. It's not like um, with those Aclips meds, they're things that really require that you look at a lab value before you continue. So I know that that's not clear to everyone and I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but <laughs> it's important for, for the staff to know that. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. For clearing up. <laughs> I'll open it for any other questions. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I will look out for an email from me within either later today or earlier tomorrow um, with some of the post assessment questions. And if you could just answer me back and I will send you the CE code. But other than that, thank you for listening to me today. <laughs> thank you.